so thank you, Paul, for coming to talk to us today. And uh, it feels to me like the the transitions that we've been asking about or talking about through all of society, uh, everyone's being asked to change. But in your work in the school system, there's four groups of people who have been asked to do a new thing. The admin, the teachers, the students, and the parents. So who do you think has the biggest challenge to do a new thing? Well, it's, it's tough on everybody, but I think the toughest is the parents who are having to juggle both work and uh, helping their children uh, with their online learning. And for some parents, if they're working from home, they have that real juggling of trying to do their job, but also trying to keep their children engaged. And it's a really difficult transition. Yeah. So some kids do better at home uh, where it might be quiet and they find school a little chaotic and other kids find school a relief from home that might be difficult. Like, how are we going to support both? It's really interesting. Uh, in my class of 22, I think eight families are in a traditional home and the rest are in apartment buildings. Uh, one family I'm thinking of, uh, when I did an online session with a student, they had, he has, the student has, I'm trying to think, seven brothers and sisters, six brothers and sisters. And there were four of them visible uh, at the same on time learning in that same small room doing different activities. Um, and this particular student is, is a good student and keeps up with his work, but it was such a revelation to see me, to see almost like a, a, a Charles Dickinson, Dickinson type, um, Dickens type scene of, of, of all these bodies working in the same area in such a small space. So it's quite challenging in that respect. So the spaces that our students are in um, is a challenge. Uh, um, and I think for some of them to struggle just to get space and time to do online learning is, is, is really quite, quite enormous. We don't realize when we set out assignments from school that they're received in such a chaotic um, um, normal family environment that it's hard for them to get time to do to do their work. So we've had to uh, uh, modify our expectations. And if somebody is if a student just completes some work, we say that's great, um, rather than expect them to do everything on offer. So some of those students, like if you talk about a, a family that has six or seven kids in an apartment they'll all have assignments from school at different times. Yes, um, in that particular family, five are at school. Uh, and so they, are, um, they, are, they have to share the three iPads they have amongst, amongst them. Um, and they have to schedule uh, times to communicate with, 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 with the teacher and, and so forth. It's really quite interesting. That particular family is doing it really well. Uh, other groups where there's um, um, uh, not quite a supportive uh, um, family environment, they just can't, they just can't function and they just seem to give up. And they'd do better in school if they had a chance to be in a more disciplined uh, situation. Yeah, um, yes, because I think school pr provides a certain continuity and, and, and you know what you're getting. And I think for some of these students, that's been the main thing that they've missed with this COVID-19. They haven't had that consistency um, uh, of, of, just the, of their day, I guess. Yeah, my own son was one who always needed to know what was coming next and he liked routine and he liked, he liked not to be surprised by things. <laughs> right, right. School was good. So one of the things that interested me in your in our initial conversation, you had had talked about the school system that we have now, the structure we have now. It's kind of based on a 19th century model of um, education to get a class of educated workers, and we've run with that for a couple of hundred years, or a hundred years. So, what do you see um, being the needs or the model 
that we're going to need for the 21st century? It's, it's really interesting that um, when, when we think about how our um, education system happened in the Victorian age, it really came about in about 1870s when they started to make education compulsory in Britain. Uh, and it didn't really change literacy rates too much. At the time, average literacy was about 83%. And after they had compulsory schooling, it got up to about 88 or 89%. And even now, it's arguably only about 97% um, literacy rate for the population. So the idea of having these children at the same age group in batches, like a, a production line, and you send them through, um, I guess worked for the uh, um, Industrial Revolution, but it's not really uh, what we need now. We talk about having um, a diversity of learners and diversity of how we deliver our programs to learners, yet we're still um, um, using the batch system of educating them. Um, so I guess the online uh, um, experience that we've had has taught us something about targeting um, these diverse students in a more diverse way. And I think the answer uh, going forward is to, is to almost as you were, have individual education plans for each student. And it sounds a little bit complicated, but the online uh, learning has given us a chance to target individual students more, um, more to their needs. And I think that's a good thing going forward. That makes it really tough on the teachers, I would think. If you have a class of 22 kids and you've got 21 programs that you're setting up. Yeah, even now, we, we, we often, in our class of 22 that I have, it's grade five and six, we're tending to have four or five groups of learners at the, at the same ability. So you're already doing that in a way. Um, it's just that you'll probably um, be more, uh, we would probably em emphasize in that diversity more. Um, and another thing is that if a child finishes grade five, they automatically move on to grade six. We're not holding students back um, so that they go at their own pace. And that's, that really is a, um, the problem of the, of the batch system is that we're advancing students that shouldn't be advanced um, and holding back students that should be moving forward quicker. Um, and so if we did away with the, with the batch system, the industrial revolution type way of educating, we would have children moving at their own pace and it may make them happier and more engaged with school. But you always end up balancing that with uh, connecting them to their peer groups as well, right? This is a tricky thing. Um, um, I'm going to go back for an example. Um, um, I come from New Zealand and some of the country's schools have three classrooms and they'll have um, a primary classroom, an intermediate classroom, and sometimes if it's a very small community, they'll have uh, a, a secondary or a, um, a middle school classroom. Uh, and those learners um, are learning roughly at their own pace so that they, 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 they do um, very well because it's, it's a more Montessori type um, environment. They, 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 they tend to grow at the pace that they're going at. Um, and it seems to be quite successful. It's very difficult to do it in, in, a, in a large inner city school, but I think it's something we want to aim for is children to progress at the pace they need to pay to, to, to go at. Um, Dunsi or Ping once said, it doesn't matter if the mouse is black or white so long as it catches, doesn't matter, whoops, I have to correct that again, sorry. It doesn't matter if the cat is black or, black or white so long as it catches the rat. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter whether a child learns um, division in grade three or grade five, so long as they, they learn it. And so I think worrying about getting the children through in the escalator of this batch system education um, causes more problems than it does um, good. I think, it's, I think we want to look at so long as they get it in the end. It doesn't matter when they get it. Well, you know what, that reminds me of, of my own mother who went to, uh, in Saskatchewan to a one-room schoolhouse. And um, so she had grade uh, uh, one to 10, I think, in the school. And 
Um, so the kids who were more able to learn were actually listening to some of the lessons above them and picking up on that. And kids who needed more time could listen to the classes below them and get that reinforced as, as that was being taught to the, the lower grades. And so they sort of, they were, they had the whole spectrum of teaching in, uh, in one room. Yes. And actually, when, when you talk about a one room classroom, it makes me think about the First Nations educational experience. They were essentially one room classrooms when they were uh, in the pre-European context. Uh, they were learning all together. Um, and the knowledge was passed on through stories and so forth. So there is a lot of good in that way of delivering um, learning. I could see that. So with our virtual life increasing, you know, we're thinking about all the new things that are possible and people talking about working from home. Do you think in the future we will still need school buildings and school grounds? Well, this is the thing that we've learned this last 10 weeks is that for elementary school in particular, learning is social. And when you take away the social aspect of learning and replace it with the almost sterile online learning, the children miss out on that intangible um, working together and working cooperatively. So I think there's always going to be a need for um, schools if for social reasons alone. Uh, and I think it's... Um, this is such a tricky world to navigate. And if you're having to do it through the artificial online uh, community, I think you get um, uh, a distorted view of the world. And I think children need uh, to play together, to work together, to be part of a community, uh, interacting with each other, learning how to occupy the space of a classroom considerately and kindly and, and things like that. And I don't think we can replace that. So I do think that uh, schools um, uh, as a community center, as a meeting point, as a center of learning is gonna be, is invaluable and will be here for, for as long as I can think. But I think it will have to modify how we, how we deliver our programs um, and perhaps make our classes uh, more open or more, um, uh, I'm trying to think now, I've lost my train of thought, but um, try to make our classrooms um, uh, less of a production line and more of a, a venue of discovery. Ah. I'm just trying to imagine what that looks like. So, what do you think? This is what our job is. Our job is to teach our students skills, core core competencies as you were. And we're teaching them skills for jobs that don't exist. So they're gonna go out into the job market in 10 or 15 years time, and they'll be doing jobs that we haven't even thought of. And I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, 30 years ago, I trained as a graphic designer, and I had to draw uh, logos and graphic design by hand. We would, we would paint our logos by hand um, and, and figure out how our designs were according to the principles and elements of design uh, and so forth. And that particular activity of painting these laborious logos by hand has been replaced by computers. But who would have thought 30 years ago that I'd be doing designs on computers in twice the time, in, in, in half or an eighth of the time, uh, and it would be a whole new industry of web designing that's come out of that. It's still, it's still graphic design, but the particular job it is now is totally different to what I was trained, trained for. And there's many, many other um, jobs that we can think of. I mean, um, a web designer, um, uh, um, YouTuber. I mean, my students in, in school talk about YouTubers, people that play video games and post it and earn, earn a living from the number of hits other people look at their video gaming. It's extraordinary so we are training children for these jobs that don't exist um, and that's kind of a, 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 a mind-blowing idea to begin with <laughs> i know the feeling <laughs> so what do we need to remember as 
the new world unfolds? Like what are some of the, of the values of education that, that in a new world you don't want lost? For certain, we want to um, keep learning social and that we learn to be cooperative. We need to work as teams and uh, work together. Uh, we're not going to be able to work in for the same company for 40 years and retire. Our new workforce is going to have to be adaptable. We're going to have to be able to work uh, two or three careers in a lifetime. Uh, and I think um, for that to happen, we need our students to be um, experts at getting on with people. So lots of social opportunities and working with different kinds of people and different challenges. Yeah, we need, we need to live the diversity in, in the way we educate our students, but also we need to uh, arm them to be open-minded uh, and lifelong learners throughout their life because they're going to need this. Um, one of the problems with so much information being online is that I'm noticing my students tend to check out. They have so much information at their fingertips that they are overwhelmed uh, and they would rather put their hand up and say, how do you do this? Or, What's this answer? Or what, rather than try to describe figure out the answer for themselves. Yep. I think it's just because there's just too much information. And, and one of the problems is that we're taking away the fun of discovery. Uh, when you, I'm going to give an example. When you read a book and you're imagining the story, take for example, Harry Potter, Potter and you're imagining those characters as they come alive as you read them. And then you watch the movie and it's a totally different point of view, totally different image from what you've got. But if you only watch Harry Potter movies and never read the book, you lose that sense of imagination, that sense of wonder uh, that you get from conjuring up the scenes in your own imagination. And learning's a bit like that. Uh, each time we learn, we're transforming. We've been, learning is transformative. But if we give it on a silver plate all the time, we become less adventurous, less um, um, in awe of what we've just learned. Um, and so one of the problems with the online learning world is that too much information is, is, is handed on the plate. We're, we're so much of the online readers, we're giving our students fish, we're not teaching them how to fish. Uh, and this is a problem, I don't have the answers to it, but this is a real problem is that um, by giving our students so much information, we're just giving them fish. Uh, and we need to work out a way that we can teach them to fish. Give them some curiosity and some skills and some time to sort them out. Yes, yes. It's just one of those things. I, I, I have no answer, but I know with my own class, I try to um, um, create as much inquiry as I can to give the students a chance to figure out for themselves what something is. Well, I have to tell you, I am glad that there are teachers like you out in the <laughs> out in the educational system because uh, it's it's amazing to me how the teaching has changed from just sort of uh, product delivery to a whole thing about family engagement and and paying attention to child children's needs and developmental scales and everything else. It's just it's a really complex job. It's much more difficult than what I thought it was. When I um, trained to be a teacher, I thought I knew about this much about teaching, but having done it for a year or two or a few years now, I, I know this much and I keep on, it keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> I think that's wisdom. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate this. Uh, spiritual inquiry into into work and uh, digital age and and I'm not sure we're solving a lot of problems but hopefully we're opening up some discussions and and some some space for people to think thank you very much thanks